certainly every human, even the fastest Olympic sprinter. For us, there was a touch of sadness in watching them hooning, because it was a reminder that they too had to be prepared for release very soon. Afterwards, all four kangaroos slept and rested in their bags in a shed. Two weeks later, we took them to a place called Magpie Hill. It was on the boundaries of a national park, many hectares of native bush, where they'd be safe from humans. And safe from cars and trucks. Magpie Hill is a favourite place for both birds and for kangaroos. There were ten young roos already in the pre-release enclosure. As a mob, the roos would have their best chance of survival. While there, they'd meet other kangaroos raised by humans. Our four little kangaroos were nervous at first, but the other kangaroos came over to introduce themselves, kangaroo style. Sparrow and Sparky and Scamp were soon settled in and met all the other roos, but Sandy Three Claws was still unsure of himself. In his short life, he had lost his mother kangaroo and now even his human kangaroo was nowhere to be seen any more. But there were still bottles of milk. It was good milk too. All the kangaroos liked it. Scamp had her turn, then Sparky. No one was forgotten, not even the big kangaroos recovering from injury. There was also delicious food to eat. Kangaroos always enjoy sharing a good meal. Then there was time to just lie in the sun and sleep. One morning, wild kangaroos came outside the enclosure. They began to play and show off. The males began to play fight. Sandy Three Claws and the others had never seen kangaroos fight like this. But there was another kangaroo near the fence. It was a mother kangaroo with a joey in her pouch. She came to the fence close to the young kangaroos. Sandy and Sparky sniffed. Then Sparrow and Scamp came up. Sandy wanted to get closer. He hung around the gate all day and watched the mob of wild kangaroos. Then one morning it was time to open the gate so the young kangaroos could go out into the world of Magpie Hill. Sparky and Scamp and Sparrow went off exploring together. Sandy Three Claws was worried, and he hung back. He was all alone again, or so he thought. But the big mother kangaroo had seen him, and she hopped closer. She invited Sandy to come with her and share some good grass. She took Sandy with her into the bush, and to all of us watching, it was obvious that Sandy Three Claws had found himself a new mother. Back at Sleepy Burrows, Evie's transition to release continued for three more months. By the end of that time, she was a full adult, weighing more than 30 kilograms, or 65 pounds. 
each day she had a run by herself in a large enclosure. And then, one day, just as it was for the release of the kangaroos, the main gate was opened, and she could go out into the bush, although she could return again if she liked. For the next three years, Evie made her life in the wild. What she did, and... What she experienced, we'd never know. We saw new wombat holes here and there, but whether they were Evie's, or even whether they were Rosie's, no human could say. There's an old saying, the bush keeps its secrets, and Evie's life was her own secret. Back in our home, we fostered more wombats. At one time, we had three of them. We had some old fellows, and we had some youngsters too, and we loved them all. We also had some more kangaroos. One had a broken leg, which, like a broken tail, can be fatal to them. But with lots of care, and the help of a wonderful vet, he recovered. We had a wallaroo, and it was the most supercilious animal you'd come across. It always demanded its own way, and got it. We had little wallabies, and they also loved to play and explore the house. We even had the tiniest marsupial, a betong, also known as a rat kangaroo. It was all challenging, but very, very rewarding. Each night, we went to bed exhausted. However, one night, we were disturbed by noises in our backyard. We went out to investigate. Whatever it was, it was a big animal, bigger than a dog or a possum. In the torchlight, I saw that it was a wombat. It was just quietly walking around, investigating every corner of the yard. Then I recognised her. It was Evie, older, bigger, and a little bit greyer. She came onto the veranda. We opened the door, and Evie wandered into the house as if she had never been away. She sniffed in a corner, and Jane realised what she wanted. Jane quickly found a bowl, some horse feed, and then, as a treat, a dollop of oats. When she put the bowl down, Evie scampered over and started woofing down the food. How she had found us again these years later, I'll never know. But somehow she had crossed bush and farmland to seek out our home, which had once been her own home. Evie checked out every corner of the house, and she remembered the places she had played. 
Our pantry was still an attraction for her, and playing with the flower bucket. There's a conundrum in this story about wombats and kangaroos, especially in regard to wombats. Namely, do wombats belong to humans, or do humans belong to wombats? Of course, the answer is neither. In 1928, Henry Beston wrote, The animal shall not be measured by humans. In a world older and more complete than ours, they are more finished and gifted. Living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time. Evie is still with us. She made a home in our back paddock in an old drain. She comes out every night, after a long day's sleep, to explore her world, and ours. Sometimes we go to Magpie Hill. We see that the four kangaroos are still together in a little mob. They watch us, and then they hop off into the safety of the bush.